Matthew 2, chapter 16, uh, verse 16, chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he realized that he had been outwitted by the wise men, flew into a rage. He gave orders to massacre all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under, in keeping with the time he had learnt from the wise men. Then what was spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled, because they are no more. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, welcome to our last fulfillment passage in our Advent series. Uh, with Christmas so tantalizingly close, it may be hard to restrain ourselves in this waiting period without jumping ahead to Jesus' arrival. But while we can, we're going to sit in this waiting space just a little bit longer. Uh, for what might seem like a bit of a downer passage, uh, will hopefully be of great comfort to you. How can a passage about an evil dictator killing innocent children be of comfort? For that, we will spend a bit of time thinking through Matthew's use of Jeremiah 31 uh, that we heard Anne read out for us and how it is fulfilled within the context of Herod. And we'll see how the worst suffering leads to the greatest victory. Uh, why don't we pray before we get stuck into it? Our Heavenly Father, what we have not give us, what we know not teach us, and what we are not make us. And for the advancement of your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. Uh, when we look back over our lives, uh, often there are moments or events that stand out. And these milestone moments stand out as unique or significant. Some of these milestones may be the birth of a child, finishing school or university, or maybe a wedding day or a significant moment at work. Now, these are all positive milestones. But of course, some milestones aren't as positive. Uh, events such as significant illness or the start of prolonged sickness, the loss of a child or a spouse or a divorce. Now, these moments, for better or worse, shape our lives. We orientate years of our lives, sometimes decades, around these events. And it's often in remembering such events in the past that help us to frame our present and to move us forward in the future. If I was to ask what milestone Israel had as a nation, or milestones, I wonder what you would come up with. Uh, what comes to mind? I think when we boil it down, two stand out. One of great joy and the other a bittersweet event. Now, the first we heard from about last week, uh, the Exodus, God calling his son Israel out of Egypt in Hosea. But we also saw that the Exodus was ultimately pointing forward to Jesus. And Matthew links these two. The fulfillment Matthew speaks of is not predictive but rather typological. Uh, something that's happened in the past is a pattern for something that's happened in the life and ministry of Jesus. And so Matthew comes to the second bittersweet event that would be firmly in the minds of his readers, the exile of Judah, uh, the southern kingdom, into Babylon and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. But why this event in the context of Herod. Well, let's turn and look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 16, before we look at Jeremiah and come back to Matthew. Herod had a clear plan, didn't he? And we saw it earlier in chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2, verse 3, when Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed by the news of a new king. He secretly summons the Magi to know the exact time that the star had appeared. And so now he knows where the child is and roughly how old the child would be. 
And what was implicit is made explicit in verse 13, which we heard about last week. After they had gone, that is, the Magi, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Get up, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to kill him. Joseph is warned in a dream that Herod seeks the child. To what? Honor him? Worship him? No, it's to kill him. This child is a threat to his authority, to his position, and to his power. And so Herod does what seem what he Herod does what he needs to to maintain his safe and secure position. Uh, this is not uncharacteristic for him, as we heard the last few weeks. Uh, for a man who killed off most of his family and any figure that he deemed a threat to his position, killing children in Bethlehem fits who he is. And he doesn't take chances, does he? He knew the child king would be around 12 to 18 months and in Bethlehem. And so hedging his bets, he gives the order to kill all the boys, to and under, in and around Bethlehem. Uh, Most commentators note this number would have been around 20 to 30 children. That's not maybe as many as we might think, but one innocent life lost is one life too many. Within the space of two short chapters, Matthew is showing that even amongst the wonderful news of the arrival of the long-awaited Messiah, the one to whom the prophets had pointed and Israel had waited for so long, opposition has already begun. Opposition to Jesus and opposition to God's plan to rescue humanity. We really shouldn't be surprised at this, should we? Uh, Herod has been outwitted and deceived by the Magi and so flies into a rage. It's not just worry, but deep-seated animosity. On a basic level, it's merely political. He's wanting to keep his position, wanting to retain power. But there is a deeper level. Herod's hatred for this shepherd ruler from Bethlehem shows the deep-seated animosity towards God and his Christ. And this has been the way ever since the garden, hasn't it? God gave Adam and Eve everything they needed, but they doubted the goodness of God and so placed themselves as rulers. Do you remember the consequences? Banishment from the garden and from God's presence. God said to the serpent that he would put hostility between the serpent and the woman, his offspring and hers. In the very moment that God enters history as a child, as the offspring of the woman, he is attacked by the offspring of the serpent. Uh, If you want to read more about it in slightly different language, uh, have a look at Revelation 12. Herod inflicts great suffering on God's people. Uh, In this, he represents many people's attitudes towards Jesus. Those who fight to control their own lives and seek to maintain their own status and power ultimately rejecting God. This rejection of God leads to hostility towards and the suffering of God's people. Jesus, as we saw last week, is safe by God's providence. God has kept him safe in Egypt. But even now, at the start of his account, Matthew is showing that for God's people, even in the midst of growing the growing light of salvation, the darkness of sin will bring suffering. Uh, so if you're following on the outline, uh, we're up to point three. Uh, sorry, I forgot to mention the first two. Uh, restoration promised. Uh, the growing darkness and the hostility towards God's people will not always be the way. And so we come to the fulfillment of the words from Jeremiah, and the future hope of restoration. Now Matthew says in verse 17 and 18, Then what was spoken through, the, through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. 
Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be consoled because they are no more. One commentator notes that Matthew has chosen the one verse in Jeremiah uh, 31 that is negative in outlook. But is that completely true? Uh, So just a bit of background, Jeremiah is writing to God's people on the cusp of their second major milestone. If the first was the joyous exodus, deliverance from slavery, then the second is the bittersweet 80-year exile into Babylon. Bitter, because it meant that the loss of their country to a foreign invaders, the destruction of the temple and the holy city of Jerusalem. All the promises given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob all seem to be unraveling. All the promises that we've been hearing about in our Genesis series. And yet, there is a sweet note of hope. Like many of the prophets writing at this time, Jeremiah offers words of hope. All throughout chapter 31, the Lord speaks declarations of bringing his people home from exile. Uh, chapter two, uh, Verse 2 of 31 Uh, Those who survived the sword found favor in the wilderness. Uh, Verse 4, the rebuilding and uh, planting. And there's a return to joy. Verse 8, the Lord will gather his people and return them to the land. Verse 9, the Lord will be their consolation. Verse 10, the Lord who scattered them will restore them and watch over them like a shepherd guards the flock. In verse 11, the Lord ransomed Jacob and redeemed him. These are wonderful promises that those in Matthew's day would have been aware of. But these promises of restoration for the future assume the completion of the promises of destruction and suffering in the present. And that's what we see in the rest of Jeremiah. We see the realities of this destruction in our verse from Matthew, in verse 15 in Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. A voice was heard in Ramah, bitter weeping and lament. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted for her children because they are no more. And now Rachel is not around at this point. She's been dead hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, She's the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, uh, who we were looking at uh, only a few weeks ago. So what's Rachel doing? Uh, Rachel is depicted as a figurative mother of Israel, weeping for the destruction and judgment that is to come, lamenting because of the suffering. But I wonder if you picked it up as Anne read it out. In verse 16, there's a drastic change. Immediately, we hear these words from the Lord. Verse 16, this is what the Lord says. Keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for the reward for your work will come. This is the Lord's declaration. Yes, there will be death and destruction, suffering and hardship, but do not think that that is the end. There is hope for your future. The basis of these promises of restoration came earlier in chapter 3, or verse 3. Even in the midst of Israel's disobedience and rejection of God, he remains faithful to his commitment to them. Verse 3, the Lord declares that I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued to extend faithful love to you. In times of suffering, and of seasons feeling as though in exile, do you remember our covenant-keeping God? The pattern of Scripture shows us that God is committed to His people. He was committed to them before they were a nation, and He was committed to them in Jeremiah's day, even despite their sin. God is committed to His people, and He showed that 2,000 years ago in giving His Son Emmanuel. And so that was restoration 
after suffering. Uh, Point five now, looking at Jeremiah in Matthew. Uh, Hopefully the connection between Jeremiah 31 and Matthew is becoming a little bit clearer. In Jeremiah's day, the devastation brought by the enemies of God's people is going to be swallowed up by the merciful salvation that the Lord God will work for Israel. At the birth of Jesus, the wicked King Herod calls for the cruel murder of the babies of Bethlehem. But the lamenting deepens the joy felt that the Messiah escapes to bring salvation. The salvation Jesus brings is made all the more wonderful because of the pain has made it all the more precious. As promised, the people in Jeremiah's, uh, the people of Israel returned to the land and waited for the day when God himself would be their shepherd, that God would be their comforter. And Matthew says that the day you were looking for, the day you were waiting for, and the day you were watching for has come. Jeremiah's words of return from exile are here. And so remember, this is our fourth fulfillment passage, uh, three being typological or patterns, uh, something that happens in the past, that's a pattern for something that finds its fullest and deepest meaning in the life and ministry of Jesus. And so only the second was predictive, where the child would be born. Jesus is the fulfillment of the pattern of God redeeming his people out of suffering and out of exile. Just as with the patterned fulfillment of the Exodus and Jesus that we heard last week, the second milestone is the exile and Jesus. Or more specifically, the return from Babylonian exile and the restoration that Jesus brings coming into the world. Yes, there will be suffering. But Matthew is saying, look, the restoration from exile has begun. The coming of Jesus, the time of the exile, is drawing to a close. God, Emmanuel, is with us. For Matthew's first audience, they would have known Jeremiah 31, 15 well. But they would have also known the hope that surrounds those verses and the hope of the whole chapter. The chapter climaxes in 31 to 34 with this declaration from the Lord. Look, the days are coming when I will make a new covenant. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will forgive their iniquities and never again remember their sins. The suffering of time in exile would soon come to pass and give way to the greatest victory. Matthew, as he did last week, intends for his readers to draw on the whole redemptive story. He is pointing to the fact that God will restore after this sorrow, even as he restored Israel after the exile. And that's how Matthew ends his good news of Jesus. In much, the way, in much the same way as he started, by showing that it is through suffering that leads to the greatest victory. Now, point six on your outline. For what might have seemed like a monumental failure, the death of Jesus is the greatest victory the world has ever seen. The lamenting and weeping of his disciples turns to joy as the resurrected Jesus stands among them. God would be forever with them and with us. The depth of sorrow that the cross brings only heightens the joy of the resurrection. Jesus, or just as the sorrow of that night in Bethlehem, heightens the joy of Jesus inaugurating the restoration of God's people, fulfilling and bringing forth the fullest meaning of the return from exile. And just as Jeremiah's words, spoken of comfort, hope, and restoration, restoration, admits words of suffering and destruction. As we think about Christmas, 
the coming of God in the flesh, we look back and see the wonderful things God has done. For the people of God, this is one of the biggest milestones. It's in line with the bittersweet milestone of the death and resurrection of Jesus, fulfilling God's plan for salvation. Is this your experience at Christmas? Or does it get crowded out by everything else going on? And if it does get crowded out, is the next milestone on your radar? I want to encourage you to keep the next milestone at the forefront of your mind. Jesus returning to call his children home, the second advent. A few months ago, we worked through uh, the book of 1 Peter, uh, written to followers of Jesus, exiles and strangers scattered throughout the world. The book expresses, amongst others, the theme of hope for the coming restoration and our heavenly inheritance, and that living out our lives as wholehearted student followers of Jesus will not be easy. Peter recognises, just as Matthew does in our passage today, that Jesus gives us a pattern and a path to follow in. A path often marked, waiting in suffering and hardship. But as we see in Jeremiah and in Matthew, it's in this waiting and longing that our anticipation for our heavenly home grows. Our hope and expectation for Christ to return, to renew all things, to restore all things, deepens. My prayer is that this truth will shape your reality, that Christ's certain return will shape how you work, how you view the church, spend your money, build relationships with non-believers and share the good news of Jesus? Do you long for the day when Christ will return? Does our sure and glorious future shape your present today? As we saw in Jeremiah and throughout the Gospels, God is faithful to his promises. Promises that say that he will not leave this world in a broken state, but he will abolish sin and death. Jesus leaves us with these words of encouragement from Revelation 21 as we wait for his advent. Look, God's dwelling is with man and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from every eye. Death will be no more. Grief, crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. Look, I am making all things new. Yes, I am coming soon, says Jesus. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these words in Matthew. I thank you that Matthew can look back uh, to a time of suffering and destruction before the exile and during the exile, but can see uh, the hope of restoration. And thank you that it points us forward uh, to waiting uh, for when Christ will come back and re- and return and restore all things and renew all things. Father, we pray that uh, that day uh, would come soon. Thank you for Christ and the work that he did on the cross, that he died for our sins and rose to give us new life. We thank you for that and we glorify his name. Amen.